Good to have all of you this morning, folks. Good to be here. Father, I pray for the gift of teaching, and I pray that you give me wisdom in the Scripture, and then I pray you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, turn to Job 38. Job chapter 38. Verse number 7, Job 38, verse 7, and uh, keep in mind now the book you're reading from, chapter, the book in the book, the book you're reading from is about 1,900 years before Christ. It is at least 500 years older than the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so you're reading about a time before Israel ever had a priesthood. You're reading about a time before there was ever a tabernacle, any scripture, no teaching priest. You're talking about a time when you have ancient revelation and ancient wisdom about the creation. And this is what you're going to start with this morning from from, uh, uh, Job 38. Now look at verse 7. He's talking about in verse 6, the creation of the world. In verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now this is a direct reference to the creation of the world. Probably the creation of the universe. But the bottom line is that the angels were so amazed when God brought it into being that it literally blew their mind. If you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter number 1, and verse 1, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, Elohim, God, bara, created, to me means to bring forth from nothing the heaven and the earth, So therefore, he spoke into existence everything that you know is physical that makes up this earth and the the star system and all of that. He spoke it into existence. He didn't speak man into existence, but he spoke this creation into existence. (laughs) And the angels literally were blown away. Now come on down to the 38th chapter of the book of Job. And verse number 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences, Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Now look carefully at what you're reading. I have a lot of uh, critics that say that when you get into what I'm talking about for the first few minutes of the, of the lesson this morning, they say, well, you're going way out of bounds of the Bible, and now you're getting into astrology. No, this is not astrology. This is the revelation of God before Scripture was written. In the heavens, they were able to look up, and they could see a message that God had prepared for any that would look up, and this wisdom was handed down from generation to generation. Hold your place in Job and go to Psalm 19. Verse 1. The scripture says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now watch carefully verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is, now look at this, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, his circuit to the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. 
Now go with me to the book of Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, verse 18. <clears throat> Romans 10, 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went unto, into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. What in the world is he quoting? Well, Paul is quoting something that happened before scripture was ever written. And the reason he's quoting it is because it is a witness to God. For the 10th chapter of Romans is about being saved. And so the apostle Paul is saying, not only do you have scripture now that you can preach to people, but there was a time when you didn't have a written word, yet God still had a witness. And the witness is in the stars, it's in the heavens that, uh, that are above your head. Now, when you take this and you put it together, here's what you get. You get a message that is as clear as it can be that these constellations, or as it is said in Job chapter number 38, Mazareth, if you'll look that up in a lexicon, you'll find that it is a plural of constellation, and therefore it has to do with all 12 of them, not just one. And when you look at this, you'll have to say to yourself, there's a reason why that these each one of these uh, uh, constellations in the heaven, there's a reason why each one of them has a picture, an arbitrary drawing that connects these stars, and there's a picture there. Because if you just look up at night to these stars in the heavens, there's no way in the world that you can make Virgo or Leo, and then all that goes in between the two of them out of it. Because there's no set pattern. It's not like the stars are just arranged to where it draws it out for you. They were arbitrarily placed there. The reason they were is because God gave that as a witness to his people before the scripture was written down. And this is why Jeremiah said, Be not dismayed with the stars of the heavens or the he as the heathen are. Now here's what happens with astrology. They take an ancient knowledge of scripture and they try to, and they, and they try to form it into a religion that begins to prognosticate your future and connect you with a certain sign that you were born under, and so forth and so on. People today take a very shallow view. You, you take a very, very shallow view if you think that what I'm saying today is connected at all with astrology. Not, a, not at all. The Apostle Paul quoted this in the book of Romans chapter number 10. Is he practicing astrology? He quotes Psalm 19, and he gets into it. Now, here's the point. This goes back before written scripture. This goes back to an ancient time on this earth. Now, if you remember when after the flood, when they came, they, the, the ark landed on the, on the mountains of Ararat, it says. Then they went down to the plains of Shinar. Now, if you can look at Zechariah and other references in the Old Testament, you'll find that Shinar is a reference to Babylon, Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the cradle of civilization. It's where it all started. It didn't start in Africa. It started in Mesopotamia from the ark where they came out of the ark. They went into the ark from where they were created when man, God made man in the Garden of Eden. And Eden stretched all the way from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Tigris and Euphrates River. All right? You have, you have the anthropologist and the rest of them, they're trying to their dead level best to mess you up in the origins of man. Man did not evolve, folks. He was created. All of a sudden, he shows up. And so the Valley of Mesopotamia is the origin of mankind present after the flood. Now, here's what's important about that. This is Babylon, but it's also ancient Sumeria. Being ancient Sumeria, we're going back to the Babylonian Talmuds or the Sumerian Talmuds and the religion of that day. A good study is to go back before the written word of God and see what people were saying. We have cuneiform tablets that date all the way back to this time in Sumeria, an ancient civilization, and they have a lot to say. They talk about a people called an Anunnaki. How many ever heard of them? These Anunnaki, according to the Sumerians, 
were people who came down, humanoid type creatures that came down from above, down to this earth, and they were instrumental in the creation of mankind. And they're not the only ones that have a story about something coming down. For example, let me read this for you. This is, uh, once again, we go back to Marie Orsic. Remember her? Marie Orsic? She was the, the one that it was, uh, who started the Vril Society in Germany that uh, ceased to exist after World War II. But Marie Orsic was a medium. Now, what's a medium? A medium is somebody you want to stay away from. <laughs> That's the simplest way to put it. Leave them alone. Because a medium is someone who plugs into familiar spirits. That's what the Bible calls them. What's that? That's a demon. That is a spirit being impersonating someone else. And they're good at it. They're very good at it. Because the, it's a, a woman's voice can change from a female to a male voice. And the voice can sound exactly like your departed loved one. And they can have knowledge that only your departed loved one would have. And if you know this, then it's going to blow you away because you're dealing with an intelligent being that is able to, once they hook you, they can manipulate you from that moment on. Marie Orsic was, a, uh, was, was, was in the Vril Society, and she would have these, uh, she would have these uh, seances, these seances to the medium. And here's what she said. In November 1924... Orsic attended a meeting in Munich, Germany. In attendance were Orsic, Rudolf Hess. How many remember him? Rudolf Hess is the one who got on an airplane and flew it to England and ostensibly to, to try to establish some kind of a peace between Germany and England. And they locked him up and he died in prison. He lived to be 90-something years old, I think. But anyway, Orsic, Rudolf Hess, and Rudolf von Sebendorf founder of the Thule Geschelschaft. The purpose of the meeting was to utilize Orsic to channel communications, now watch this, from Dietrich Eckhart. Dietrich Eckhart was a master occultist. A prior Thule member who died one year earlier, during the session, the voice of Eckhart emanated from Orsic. The voice of a man came forth from the woman. Suddenly the message stopped and the voice of Eckhart proclaimed that a very important message had arrived. The voice changed to an unknown woman's voice and identified itself as the Sumi, dwellers of a distant world which orbits the star Aldebaran in the constellation you call Taurus the Bull. Now here we go. We have a medium that is being used as a voice for a extraterrestrial up there somewhere in some some uh, in Taurus, in some con in some place up in there, and it has a message for the people that are there. Now, folks, these people in Germany fully believed what they were hearing, and they and not all of them, but many of the high command were completely immersed in the occult, absolutely and completely immersed in it. Now. One of the messages that they're getting from the whatever it is up there is that there are many different messages, but one of them is that evolution is definitely, definitely real. It's a reality. They put their, they put their approval and their signature to evolution. So whatever they started has evolved since then to where we are today at 2017, and the evolution, of course, is going to continue. There's no end to it. There's no stopping point. You're evolving physically, socially, spiritually until you become a superman. Remember I told you that when Charles Darwin came out in the, with his Origin of the Species and the favored races, let's see, let's get him right here. What was it he called it? The uh, uh, Darwin's, uh, this is the part that they drop off. They don't, they don't you know, they... It's an, you know what they don't say is a lot of times is louder than what they do say. Here it is. The origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. He made it a racist thing. And, of course, he goes on. He said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, 
the civilized races of men will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. Now, let me ask you a question. Those of you that have been uh, beaten and pummeled with, uh, with the evolution through coming up through high school, did you ever hear that quoted? Your biology teacher, anthropology, whoever taught you, they never quoted that. Why? You see, like I say, it's what they don't say sometimes screams louder than what they do say. And here's why they don't say that. Because they want to divorce Darwin and his, and his obvious racism from this wonderful knowledge of evolution. Now remember this. Evolution is based on a premise that there's some kind of force, power, something that is out here at work. They can't define it. They can't describe it. But there's something at work creating or causing to come into existence all of this, this intricate, complicated process of living tissue and living beings into the future. See, they can't define it. There's no definition for it because they don't know what it is, according to them. All right. I got no problem with it because I don't believe it to begin with. But I do know that the, the force that is a work out here, the power that's a work, according to the book of Colossians, he upholdeth all things by the word of his power. Amen. We know the Lord Jesus Christ is the sustainer of the universe. According to the Hindu religion, he's Vishnu. He's the sustainer of the, of, of, of the creation. But remember, the, the Hindu trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, is a, is, is, we'll get into it in the future, but it is, a, it is a perversion of ancient truth. Remember this. The truth only comes through one source. You've got to remember this. This is so important. God gave the Jew the oracles of God, Romans 9. It is through them that absolute truth comes, and the Bible is absolute truth. It comes through them. But out here, you can see where it is perverted, and you can see where there's a common source. And that's what I'm trying to show you this morning. So evolution from its foundation, which goes all the way back to Samaria, it goes back to ancient Babylon. Imagine the Anunnaki. Imagine these Babylonian cuneiform tablets, this ancient civilization. That, that, that is at least 1900 B.C. or even possibly before, before Scripture was written. Imagine these people back there when they are, they are beginning to develop the doctrine of evolution because that's what they had been receiving from spirits. And then it was passed down from generation to generation. Plato talked about it. It comes on down until, lo and behold, we have Charles Darwin make this great discovery and, of course, he didn't discover anything. But here's the basis of it, folks. The basis of it is that the doctrine of evolution is based on occult science. Amen. If you are an evolutionist, you are an occultist. It is, it is what we call, it is, it is, it is the fact that there, a spirit being has laid the foundation for what you, for what you, what you are so calling to be science, what you believe is science. The foundation of it, the origins of it, and everything about it is based on metaphysical, paranormal occultism. That is evolution. Now you've got to make a choice. You either believe that or you believe the Creator Amen. who brought into being everything there is. But you see, that's just the beginning. That's just the foundation because it goes a whole lot further than that. But I want to emphasize that point, that this thing about evolution. Now, how many has ever heard of Zachariah Sitkin? A lot of you do your reading and you, you know. Zachariah Sitkin was, I think he was a Russian, and he came to this country. And by his own testimony, he says, when they were reading the book of Genesis, chapter number 6, where the sons of God knew the daughters of men, and then they, the scripture says that they, that they came unto them and giants were born in those days. All right? If you take a Hebrew text or take your, take your lexicon and look up the word giant, you'll see that it is the word Nephilim. And it comes from the Hebrew verb nafal, which means a fallen one. 
You've got two groups then in Genesis 6. You've got the Elohim. Who are the Elohim? Sons of God. Same word in Genesis 1, Elohim, is translated not sons of God, but it's translated God. Therefore, the word in Hebrew, Elohim, is a generic term that refers to spirit beings. Genesis 6, spirit beings, Elohim, came to the daughters of men. When they came to the daughters of men, son or beings were born of them, and the beings are called Nephilim. The King James Bible translated it as giants. And they had the reason for that, using that word to translate it. These Nephilim are the heroes, the gods of the ancient, Egypt, uh, ancient Greek pantheon of gods, Romans and the rest of them. Babylonians, Hinduism, Brahmism, Buddhism, and all the rest of that stuff. The many, 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 many gods they have can be traced right back to the fall in Genesis 6. They can all be traced back to that. But you'll notice that in Genesis before the flood that there is a real battle going on between the truth of the one true living God and all of this, all of this deception because they had a reason for coming down to the daughters of men. There's something going on here. So this ancient Babylonian, Sumerian uh, culture records this, this, these events in their own way. They even talk about a flood. They talk about somebody surviving a flood. Where do you think they got that from? You see, this ancient civilization has so much that is connected with the Bible, but in their own way they, they pervert it. And the reason they pervert it is because God saw to it that the only true source of truth comes through the Bible. The Bible, folks. The Bible is the oracle of God given to the Jewish people, and you are, are either a Bible believer or you're not. So when we go back and look at this thing, we say to ourselves, from the very beginning, before anything was anything, from the very beginning, Satan began to lay the foundation for deception to counter the truth of the revelation of God, and it goes all the way back, all the way back, all the way back. When you talk to a graduate of UT, University of Kentucky, Louisiana, anywhere, you talk to a college graduate that's had comparative religion. Talk to one that's had comparative religion, and I'll guarantee you this is what they were taught. They were taught that the Bible is a good book for moral instruction. You can get many great things out of it, blah, blah, blah but that the Bible is nothing in the world more than a product of an ancient Jewish people and that the doctrines that they preach in the Old Testament were their concept of ancient religious truths or perceptions that go back in time and the way the Hindu sees it or the way the Buddhist sees it or the way that the ancient Sumerians saw it or whoever else is just as good as what the Hebrews say in their Bible. That's comparative religion. And in comparative religion, they try to find a common source for the myths because as far as they're concerned, they're all myths. They find a common source for these myths. And by tracing them down to where you are today, they come along and say to you, so you believe that Mary was a virgin and Mary had a baby. And so you believe in the Virgin Mary and the Christ child. Well, didn't you know that they believed that in ancient Samaria? Didn't you know the Egyptians believed that? Didn't you know? And here and here and here and here we go. Are you following me? Are you following me? This is important because this gets to the very heart and soul of what we are and what we believe. Now, is what I believe about Christ today nothing in the world more than a rehashed Jewish version of an ancient myth? Or is it revelation from God that was perverted by people out here who had only a partial knowledge of it and God saw to it that he preserved the truth in the Holy Bible. You've got to make a choice. This is why when you say that you're a Bible believer, that means you believe the Bible. We say, well, what, what does the Hindu have to say? Well, I may, under, I may read what the Hindu has to say for, for the knowledge of it and for the fact that I may be able, through what the Hindu has to say, 
give you a picture of what's going on today and how it relates to prophecy in the Bible and all that. But I do not look to a Hindu for revelation. I look to the scripture. All right. Now, when we look at this stuff, we look at Darwin. I've made some strong statements about Darwin. How many of you got a copy of my notes last week? I had a secretary over here. She came to me. She said, a bunch of people want a copy of these notes. If you want a copy of these notes right here, this is on Darwin, evolution, and racism. I only read the top page. This is too rough, the second page. Huxley. How many read what Huxley said? Uh, Thomas Huxley, in 1865 essay, Emancipation, Black and White. Huxley remarked, and I won't read it, because it is offensive. It's very offensive. Here's what, you do, here's what you ought to do yourself now. This is, what, this is what I would do if I was confronted with something like that. Well, I'll find out if he said it. Right? I'll find out if this guy said this. I'll find out if Darwin said that. Then once you find out and you are armed with the truth, then you can begin to make a decision. You can begin to follow a path based on fact. So why is it? Why? Where did this come from? Where did this come from, 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 the, from the evolutionary point of view? Where is it leading to? Where are we headed? This is what this stuff's about in here. This is what it's about. I hope, and if you want to take the notes, I'll lay them back out again. And uh, I'll put it out here and you can make it. This is only scratching around. <laughs> I mean, I'm just scratching around the surface because this thing goes a whole lot deeper than this. <clears throat> Here's the point. I want to embarrass them to the bone. They have pummeled us for decades. They have, they have patronized us and stood up in their classrooms and talked about how stupid and dumb we are, presenting their modified form of evolution. I want to hit them with everything I've got. That's mean, isn't it, preacher? No, it's the truth. <laughs> I want to let them have it. Amen. You see, the ball's not in my court. It's in their court. Because if this is true, if this is true, they must come up with an explanation for it. Not me. I'm not the one who said it. They did. Ask them why they didn't give you the full story. And this, of course, is why I mention eugenics. And I told you how eugenics was established for the, simply for the, for, for the pur purpose of breeding out certain characteristics and races and breeding in the new man. Eugenics is based on progressive progressive revelation, occultism, the idea that evolution is going to evolve into superman, this super race, and Hitler grabbed it and ran with it. And this is where he came up with the idea of the Aryan. And he got some of it from Blavatsky in Theosophy and other places. This is where Hitler got it, and Hitler took it and ran with it. And this is what's happened. Here in this country, type in forced sterilization. Type it in. Do a Google search on it in America. Forced sterilization. What are you talking about, preacher? Nobody ever told me about that in high school. I know they didn't. <laughs> I wonder what they teach in high school anymore. <laughs> Forced sterilization. Find out who did it. Find out how long it lasted. And find out what it was based upon. Forced sterilization. Eugenics. Darwin. The half story you get about Darwin. Darwin. Put them together, and what have you got? You see where I'm going? All right. Now listen to this. This is remarkable. Uh, I got so much stuff here. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, let's go to this one right here. UFOs, unidentified flying objects, and evolution. World-renowned ufologist and archaeologist Dr. Clifford Wilson is but one of many researchers pointed out how an alien calling itself Ashtar, that ought to throw a red flag up, keeps popping up in UFO accounts along with Simjaz, who's been posing as a modern space brother. Ashtar keeps appearing in UFO literature as well as ancient text. John Keel. One of the world's most published, highly respected ufologists also noted this. Highlighting the element of deception, he wrote, quote, Thousands of mediums, 
psychics, and UFO contactees have been receiving mountains of messages from Ashtar in recent years. Ashtar is not a new arrival. Variations of this name, such as Ashtaroth, Asar, Ashar, Asheroth, etc., appear in demonological literature throughout history, both in the Orient and Occident. Now, if you don't know what Occident means, that means Western. Orient is Eastern. Mr. Ashtar had been around a very long time, posing as assorted gods and demons, and now in the modern phase as another glorious space man. He's got a lot to say about this. Amen. It's quite remarkable when you think about the fact that we've come to the point now where they're pulling back the curtain and they're communicating. And they're commu communicating on a vast scale. They want people to hear what they have to say. They want them to hear it. They've got a message and people are listening. And the people that get up in the pulpit in the church houses are beginning to preach this stuff. Amen. You say, what they don't say, remember, that's all important. You can get up and give lip service to the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're not very careful, you're really exalting Lucifer. All right. Now, who is Lucifer? All right. Now, let's listen to what David Spangler has to say about Lucifer. The New Age theologian David Spangler, speaking of Lucifer, as a savior spirit, he correlates with Christ. The true light of this great being can only be recognized when one's own eyes can see with the light of Christ, with the light of the Christ, the light of the inner sun. Lucifer works within each of us to bring us to wholeness. And as we move into the new age, which is the age of man's wholeness, each of us is brought to that point which I term the Luciferic initiation. The particular doorway through which the individual must pass if he is to come fully to the presence of this light and this wholeness. Lucifer comes to give us the final gift of wholeness, the pleroma, remember? If we accept it, then he is free and we are free. That is the Luciferic initiation. It is one that many people now in the days ahead will be facing for it is an initiation into the new age. Now, why do you think that there's so much emphasis and pushing on this progressive? You ever thought about a progressive? You, you ever heard about the progressives in America? Pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. Well, what's the point? Pushing forward, pushing forward, the progressive, the liberal progressive, to do away with the past, to do away with the foundations, to do away with Christ and Christianity. They redefine Christ. If you, first of all, have been indoctrinated into the doctrine of evolution, you have already received the spirit of Lucifer. All you need now is a introduction to the glories of Lucifer and once you are introduced to the glories of Lucifer then you will openly begin to embrace him. Amen. Lucifer is a being of light. That's what the word means. Light giver. Light bearer. Now do you remember hair? Do you remember the fifth dimension? Do you remember the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Let me remember that. When that first started in the 60s, you had Woodstock. You had all of this, you had all of this open love. You had all of this, all the inhibitions about sex and everything else was completely torn down. A new paradigm had developed. Here's what happens. They're coming out of the Piscean age, the age of Pisces, and they're moving into the age of Aquarius. To move out of Pisces is to move into a new age, the age of Aquarius. This is why it's called the New Age Movement. 
The New Age movement, of course, is nothing in the world more than Hinduism, Buddhism, Brahmism, and all the rest of it over there, rehashed, repackaged, and given to Western civilization. But anyway, here's the way it works. Coming out of the Piscean Age into the New Age of Aquarius, these astrologers, these prognosticators, they abound on the Internet. They're everywhere. All you got to do is type in something like that and you'll pull up a thousand pages and they all want to tell you what it's about and how it relates to your life and what you can get from it and what you can learn from it and all of this. Practically every one of them makes a reference back to the Lord Jesus. Now this is what I'm saying. That's going to be very important. They make a reference back to Christ in the Piscean Age. An age lasts about 2,000, 2,160 years. There's a total of 12 times 2,160, which gives you 26,000 years. That's called the precession of the equinoxes. Now, I know you can get technical with this stuff, but I want to keep it simple because that's the way I understand it. But the precession of the equinoxes simply means that when you look up into the skies, the sun will appear to be rising in a certain constellation. But if you lived long enough, you'd see it rise in another constellation because it is turning so slowly that in one lifetime, you wouldn't be able to tell much because it takes 2,160 years approximately for it to move from one constellation to the next. So what they're doing is the sun is rising now in Aquarius. And by rising in Aquarius, we're leaving Pisces and we're going into a new age. When the sun rises, you see the rising of the sun long before you see the sun itself, don't you? You see the rays as they begin to come up over the horizon. That's a sunrise. That's the way they say that the new age is rising. You're going to see preliminary views of it. You're going to see things begin to happen. You're going to see these things happening because a new age is coming up over the horizon. Christ is in the Piscean Age. They define it, most of them that I've read, define the Piscean Age as a time of death, a time of killing, a time of war. They say that the New Age, the Age of Aquarius, is a time of peace, a time of brotherhood, a time of joining together. Are you watching now? Are you seeing what's happening here? We're coming out of Pisces and we're going to Aquarius. So they take the Lord Jesus Christ of the of the, of, the, of the Piscean age 2,000 years ago, and they redefine him. They make him fit into the age of Aquarius. He is no longer the Lord, the only God there is, the Lord God manifest in flesh, God among men. He is an ascended master. See, he's the Christ. And I'm going to tell you right now, watch any preacher or any church that talks about the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. You won't hear them say the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, you don't hear much of that anymore anyway. You, you hardly ever hear his full title anywhere. The Lord Jesus Christ. You hear the Christ, the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. Watch that man. Because when he talks like that, he's talking about some kind of an anointing that came on a man. Just a man like any other man. And that anointing came on him. You see, Notovich, the Russian that I told you about before, uh, I forget his first name, but it's Nikolai, I think, Nikolai. Nikolai Notovich in the 1800s allegedly went into India, he went into a monastery in India. And when he was in that monastery in India, he was presented with some ancient documents that proved that during the silent years between the time that Christ was 12 years old and the time that he showed up at the Jordan River to be, in, to be baptized by John the Baptist, these are the silent years. Scripture doesn't say anything about that. But according to Notovich, this Russian, he said he went to a monastery in India, and this, this monk, Hindu, Buddhist, Brahma, all that, see, back, back to Babylon, back to the beginning, this monk said, oh, yes, oh, yes, 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 Jesus came here when he was a boy. And we took him into our monastery and we sat him down and we taught him the great secrets, the initiation, all the great, all the ancient truths of Hinduism, Buddhism, you know, all that. We taught him all that. And so when he went back into the Holy Land, he went back in there with this knowledge and he was able to perform miracles because of the great wisdom that he had received from ancient Hinduism, Buddhism, remember? 
from us, from the Sumerians. Remember, what have, what have you done now? You've shifted the origins of truth. You've shifted the origins of revelation. You've shifted the origin from Israel and the Holy Bible. Where have you shifted it to? You've shifted it to India. All right? That would be, they'd have a reason for saying that, wouldn't they? A self-serving reason. All right. Well, immediately he published his book, 1865, 95, somewhere in there. He published his book, and immediately Christians were alarmed, rightfully so. What'd they do? Two or three of them headed to India. And they went to the monastery he said he went to. And they went to the monks that he said he talked to. And lo and behold, guess what they found? Monk said, I've never seen Mr. Nodovich. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, what about the documents? There are no documents here. He's never been here. And so, of course, you don't hear anything about that. You type Nodovich in there, do a Google on him, and you'll pull up plenty about this guy. But you don't hear the other. Why? Well, here's, well, here's one of the reasons why. India is not the only place that the Lord Jesus was supposed to go to when he was a boy. You've got other places. They're scattered all over the place. Each one of them say, no, he came here. You know, he was with us, and on and on and on. One tradition has it that he, when he was a, a lad, he went to England. Now, how many of you have ever heard the, uh, I don't get <laughs> How many of you have ever heard uh, Jerusalem, the hymn? It's beautiful. Y'all type it in. Now, you, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. Type it in now. Jerusalem, the hymn. It's very popular in England, Great Britain. Uh, Type, do a Google on it, Jerusalem, the hymn, okay? It's beautiful. Listen, I've, I've heard it sung at Westminster. I've heard it sung, and it's beautiful. The, the, it's, like, it's like so many things that have such a catchy tune. But the words say, at one time he walked on the hills of Great Britain. Talking about Christ when he was young. He was here, they say. And, of course, that gives credence to, to, the, to, the, to the music, all right? So they're not the only ones. You've got competition out there. Uh, who knows? Uh, somebody else may pop up and say, no, he was with us during those silent years. There's a reason why the Bible's silent, right? I'm just going to leave it silent. So where was he for those silent years? I'd say he was in Israel. <laughs> That's where he was. He was with his, with his, uh, with his, uh, his earthly father and his mother. Learning the trade of carpentry. He was a carpenter. His father, his, uh, Joseph, you know, when I say father, you know what I'm talking about. Joseph taught him the trade of carpentry. So he was a carpenter. The carpenter's son, they said, when they made reference to him and, uh, and so forth. But here's the point. Everybody out there, I'm about to run out of time. I swear that 45 minutes flew by. I've got two minutes left. Everybody out there wants to own Christ and redefine him their own way. This is why it's so important for the church of God to preach Christ and him crucified, the true and living son of God. Folks, listen. It's not going to come from the government. It's not going to come from the educational establishment. It's not going to come from some false pagan religion. What men and women will ever know of the truth of Christ is going to come from the Holy Bible. Amen. And it's what the Bible says and who it says that he is. Amen. That's all I care about. Yes. That's what I'm here for. Amen. That's my purpose in being. Amen. Is to preach Christ and him crucified. Amen. Not preach Charles Lawson and him crucified but to preach Christ and him crucified. And God has blessed it and he will bless it because people are hungry and they want to they hear the truth. I've given you a lot of stuff this morning. <laughs> you take this and, and uh, meditate on it. As, like when the, when the angel told Mary she was going to have a son, the Bible said she pondered those things in her heart. <laughs> I guess she did. <laughs> I reckon so. <laughs> Nothing like that had ever happened before, and nothing like that ever happened since. Amen. She was one of a kind, the only one of her kind, Amen. the virgin daughter of Zion, impregnated by the power of the Holy Ghost, yes. and she brought forth the God-man. I'd have been doing some pondering too, wouldn't you? <laughs> All right, we'll meet again next Sunday. We'll pick it up. There's some real interesting stuff.
that once I've laid the foundation with you this morning, I can develop from this. And that's, that's what we've got to look for. All right. Brother, dismiss us, please.